Hello. <laughs> um, started on this last Wednesday night. And so when we get down to qualifications, which is where we're at, we only have that in two books of the Bible, uh, Titus and Timothy. And the reason that is is because when Paul put elders into place, he, um, of course, was there. So he didn't need to tell himself what kind of people that he needed to have as elders. So when he was writing to, to uh, Timothy and Titus, they were both in situations where they needed to know how to choose men to lead. But they were in two different situations. You have to understand. I think it's important we understand that. They're in two totally different situations. Timothy's in Ephesus. Ephesus is an old congregation. It's been there a while. Not new. Uh, Timothy has been there a while. He knows the people there a little better. Um, been involved in that work for a long time. Titus, on the other hand, <coughs> Titus is on Crete. When did Paul go to Crete? Does anybody know that? Because he wasn't on any of his missionary journeys, right? First, second, or third missionary journeys. He never went to Crete. So when did he go to Crete? Well, as far as we know, <coughs> man, why well, I got that. As far as we know, Paul went to Crete after he was released from his first Roman imprisonment by Nero before he was imprisoned again and was executed. He went to Crete, and as far as we know, he went to Spain. That was we maybe we would call Paul's fourth missionary journey, but we don't know much about it. But he was it was pretty short because there wasn't only about a year or maybe less than a year between when he was released and between when he was executed. Because Rome burned, Nero re-imprisoned him, and then Nero executed him. So there wasn't a long period of time involved in the middle of that. So his stay in Crete was probably a one-stop thing, number one. So he didn't come back through like he did in Acts and put elders in. The other thing was, it's probably fairly brief. So when Paul writes to Titus, he says, I left you in Crete in order to set those, in order to do those things. I basically, I didn't get done. So Titus was dealing with really young congregations, plants, really early, really young. The other thing is, is in the letter of Titus, the Cretans aren't really portrayed in a very good light. He said they're all lazy gluttons, right? So uh, they really weren't portrayed in a really good light. So that's another thing. So Crete was different than Ephesus, okay? So when we look at these lists, you kind of need to keep that in mind. Now this is Timothy in 1 Timothy 3. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. So there's a very first qualification that we often miss when we talk about elders. They have to desire it. Yeah, but that, it says that it's a work they desire to do. If he aspires to the office. <laughs> yeah. So he has to desire it. He has to. He has to want it if he aspires to it. So, well, I don't think you could force him into it. Yeah. So, I mean, you might not look at it as a qualification, but you can't just pick a man and force him into the office. And you have to, I think one of the things you have to ask is, why do they want the office? You know, why do they desire it? Um
Yeah, I don't think I look at it. I mean, myself, personally, I never really look at a man that wants to be an elder. I guess I never really look at it in the negative light. I mean, I know people do that, like, well, maybe they just want the power. But essentially in the church, I mean, unless you just want, think you have power over people in the church, you know, I really just don't see that as a, as really a tool, you know. I think, you know, the fact of the matter is an elder only has authority over us as long as we submit to the authority of the elder. So, you know, you, I mean, it's not like you can, it's not like being a boss in a company where you can force people to do something. You really don't have that kind of authority. So, you know, unless people want control of maybe finances or, but I don't think, and I know in certain congregations that's been issues over the years. But I don't know that that's, I've never known that to be an issue here, ever. Well, Timothy and Titus were actually, you would call them ministering evangelists is really what they were. And if you really look at, like the biblical example of church plants, that's kind of how it goes. The ministering evangelist would come in and have that authority until he put elders in. Now, why there weren't elders already in Ephesus, there probably were, my opinion. My opinion, there were already elders in Ephesus. My opinion of that is, is that Paul wanted him to put more elders in in Ephesus. I think Ephesus was old enough that Ephesus probably had elders, I think. Yeah, maybe, and maybe that was part of the problem. Maybe there were elders in there that didn't meet the qualification, what Paul thought they should meet as an elder. You know, maybe there were men that had stepped up that Paul said, well, maybe, maybe we need to relook at this a little bit. No, it doesn't say. Like I said, that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah, and that's really what it is. I mean, it's a servant leader, you know, if you want to look at it that way. And it's people who lead that they're still in the flock, too. I mean, they're still doing Christian things, too. You know, it's not like you're on the outside looking in, you're on the inside. You know, above reproach. Um, that's a tough one because, to be honest with you, there's probably not a, one of us in here that, well, probably some of y'all, I know I'm not one of them, that somebody can't say, couldn't say something bad about. I mean, I, there's people that could say bad things about me. I mean, I don't know if that means above reproach or not. That's what I mean. Some of these, if you're going to hold it to the finest line of the, you know, you got men that are elders that are business leaders, you know, that are businessmen. Well, if you're in business very long, I promise you, somebody's probably going to have something to say about you. You know, it's just one of those things. Um, you know, so I mean, when you talk about above reproach, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean nobody has anything bad to say about you? Does that mean, you know, what does that mean exactly to be above reproach? I think it means nothing substantiated. In other words, you know, people might say something, but it's not something that, I mean, I think if you really had something against you, something that would really stand up, I think that would be different. Right. Right.
Yeah, I think it means, you know, reproach in the way that it's something that really has substance, you know, not something that somebody just thinks or an opinion, but something substantial, you know, something that has some substance to it. Yeah, it's kind of a vetting of sorts. And I think, you know, the other thing is, as Christians, well, we'll get into that in a minute. Husband of one wife. Boy, that's, a, that's one that we've hung up on forever. You know, what does that mean? Does that mean you can only be married to one woman at a time? You know, polygamy was a thing. Not really in the first century was it a big thing. But polygamy and in Judaism was a thing, more than one wife. So some people say, well, that's what it means. You can't be married to more than one woman at the same time. But that really doesn't fit the context of Ephesus or of Crete. That really was not something that really happened. So it really doesn't have application to the churches we're writing to. So what does it mean? Can you never have been married before? Well, that's how we've taken it. Our churches have taken it for a long, long time. Um, can't ever been married. Some churches say, even in your whole life, even if it was when you were, before you were a Christian, when you was 18 years old and you was married for six months, it disqualifies you. You have to be married to one woman, period. Would that be right? Right? Should our life, before we were a Christian, should that, you know, Christ died for that, right? I mean, Christ died for that. So, if you take it and say, well, even if he was married before you were a Christian, he was married 15 years before he was ever a Christian, before he was ever a member of the church, that disqualifies you. I have serious issues with that. To me, that nullifies the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for our transgressions, died for our sin, died for our past life. The Bible says we're dead to that life. That exists in the past. So what if I was married when I was a Christian and got divorced for a scriptural reason? Or maybe an unscriptural reason. But I think we'll cover that. You know, does that disqualify me? What if my wife died and I remarried after she died? Well, I would still, technically, I would have more than one wife, right? So would that disqualify me from being an elder? No. <laughs> but I would have been married more than once. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what does it say? What does it mean? What's the intent? Sam says, well, you got to be careful because you can't like take things out. So... I'm going to tell you, Brent really says it right. What kind of man do you want to lead the church? This in the Greek literally means a one-woman man. That's what it means. Now, I think you could all agree that you've known people, men that were married, that weren't one-women men. Have you known those men? Right? That were, what does that mean? They had divided affection. They was always looking at other women. They was always oogling, always, you know, you know men like that? I've known men like that. I'm the only person in here that knows men like that. I don't think so, you know. So you got men that had divided affection. Would you want that kind of man to lead the church? No. Why? Because he has divided affection. Christ died for this church. It's his bride. He, he doesn't look elsewhere. The man that's leading should not look elsewhere. If a man was divorced in, after he was a Christian, for maybe an unscriptural reason, there's other things in this list that's going to disqualify him. For one thing, maybe being above reproach. For another thing, having a good reputation with outsiders. There's a lot of other things that's going to come into play. You know, we've disqualified a lot of people for this over the years. Well, I haven't, but the church has. Churches have. For a lot of years, because they say that's not right. You shouldn't have never been married. I don't agree with that interpretation because I don't think that's what the Greek says at all. Um, it literally, in the Greek, it means, I don't want to get this messed up. Literally, in the Greek, it means it's the same thing as saying, you know, a one, a one dog man. Does that make any sense? You know, a one man, yeah. That's what it means, right. Faithful, devoted, one wife, devoted to his wife. 
Because why? Because you're looking for that kind of man that has devotion, that has commitment, that understands what covenant is in a marriage. That, because that's what you have to have with the church. That's the kind of man you want, right? Does that make any sense? You know. So we've disqualified so many people over this over the years, and we really have to be careful with that because I really don't think that's what this means. And not just I don't think that's what that means. It doesn't back up in their language that that's what it means in the Greek and the original. It doesn't back it up that that's what it means. So I think we really have to be careful with that. There's reasons, other reasons in here, that if a man has been married more than once, maybe would be disqualified. I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't be above reproach. Maybe it was a nasty divorce. Maybe it should never happen. Maybe it was, I don't know. Other things could be involved. But I think you had to be careful with this little piece of this qualification. I think we've misused this a lot in the years, and it's harmed the church because we've lost a lot of good men because of this that should in my opinion we're plenty qualified to leave that we've lost because of this particular passage so i think we have to be careful with that does anyone want to comment on that you know that's a great question and you know for many years i thought that would disqualify matter of fact when j.a riley was an elder here many many years ago and Glenda got really, really sick. Y'all, those of you remember Glenda, you remember that? She had that brain bleed. She went in the hospital. We didn't think she was going to make it. She's in there for how long? And I remember J.A. telling me, he said, boy, if Glenda dies, I'll have to step down. And I remember praying so hard that Glenda would survive because I wanted J.A. to still be an elder. But I don't think that's right. I believe if your wife dies, I think you can still be an elder. I think you're still the husband of one wife. I don't know. I think maybe it might make men not want to be because your wives are so important in the work that you might think you can't be effective without a wife. I mean, I could understand the man stepping down because he said, I don't think I can be effective without a wife. Because when you're in ministry, whether you're a preacher or a youth minister or an elder, your wives are a huge part of that ministry, whether they want to be or not sometimes. They're a huge part of that ministry. And I could understand an elder saying, I don't think I can be effective without my wife. I could understand that. But on the other hand, I think somebody like Riley or something that had been an elder and for so many years, I think, in my opinion, he would still be qualified. What do you think, Gary? You agree with that or not? I can see that side of that for sure. You think as an individual could make that choice though, do you think? Or would we make them step down if that happened? Yeah. Yep, I can see that side of that. Yeah, Sherry. Well, it's like Gary says, you kind of have to look at the idea, is he still a husband at that point? Is he still a faithful husband at that point? I mean, I think he could be. Right. Yeah. Not that he couldn't be qualified again if he ended up remarrying and was the husband of one wife and prayed for her again. But I can see maybe him stepping down for a while. But at this point, I think he's all right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, like it says, I think most elders I know would probably step down if that happened. I think they probably would. So would they have to? Well, maybe. I mean, I don't know. You know, I think a lot of that would depend to me, would depend on the man. If it's a younger man that, if it was an older man that, I don't know. 
You know, like Gary says, would you still be the husband of one wife if your wife dies? By scripturally, you wouldn't be. Scripture says when your spouse dies, you're released. So scripturally, I don't think you would be. But if you don't take that to be a devoted husband, I think that could still apply. So, you know, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's something definitely would have to be hashed out for the individual for sure, I think. Yeah, I think a wife is, there's a reason that it's married men in the scripture. There's no doubt about that. Huh? Right. Right. Yeah, so I think that's uh, well answered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, according to Paul in Corinthians, if your spouse dies, you're no longer bound. Paul says you're no longer bound. Well, you're no longer, in other words, you're free to remarry. You know, it's in other words, that's, you're not bound to them for life. You're not you're not bound to them in death. In other words, if your spouse dies, then you're no longer bound. Paul says you're no longer bound. Right. So you're free to remarry biblically. <laughs> well, you know, Paul, he was never married. so. But, uh, you know, the idea is, well, Paul's talking about in that context of that without getting way deep into that passage he's talking about you know how we're bound in marriage and how we're not bound in marriage if you're if the unbeliever leaves you're not bound in other words if you're married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever leaves you're not bound if your spouse dies you're not bound in other words you know scripturally speaking the only reason for divorce is adultery which we're not going to get into that discussion tonight but the only, the only re scriptural reason is adultery, you know. But then Paul says, but if you're married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever chooses to leave, that you're not bound. In other words, that's, you're, you, you're free to remarry. You're not bound to them. If your spouse dies, you're not bound. So Paul's just kind of saying these are things you can do as a Christian where you're free to remarry. But then Paul also says if you remarry, you should marry in the Lord, you know. So... Marry in the Lord, you should marry somebody that's a Christian, you know, somebody else that's a believer, more or less, you know, it's kind of what it says. So, but that's a whole other discussion, but, but that's, yeah, but that's why. So, temperate. What's temperance? We all know what the temperance movement was, right? Yeah, the temperance movement, right? Did you? <laughs> temperance movement. <laughs> temperate means that. Means temperance. Means uh, it means uh, basically not prone, and mostly in this respect is alcohol. So it does. But and then it says not addicted to much wine. Not addicted to wine. Pugnacious. So there's some discussion about that. To be prudent. What does it mean to be prudent? Somebody define prudent for me what's a prudent person huh that's right good judgments people that are prudent are wise they make good decisions right they, in other words they're not hasty to decisions they try to weigh the deals they try to make good decisions they're prudent people they're not wasteful they're prudent people and that's something elders have to be all the time uh respectable that's pretty Pretty easy. Hospitable, that's a big thing in Scripture. We don't talk a lot about that in our age. But hospitality is a big thing. Hospi hospitality to strangers, being hospitable is a big, that's a big thing in the first century church. Maybe something we don't think much about in this century church, 
But in the first century church, it was a big thing. Because when people went into town, people stayed in your house. People, that's what Jesus said, right? Go in there, stay with who wants you. You know, be hospitable to strangers, you know. Uh, hospitable to people. Um, able to teach. That's a big qualification for an elder. Why? And I think that's important. They should be able to teach because they should know God's word. They're the people who really dictate our doctrine, who dictate what's said uh, from the pulpit. Um, they're the people who, who, um, who set that standard. So, you know, I think in the days of first century, it was a little different because those men were, um, uh, the elders probably were the, the wisest people in there. It's kind of a different age now where preachers go to, a lot of times go to preaching school or go to college or maybe have masters in divinity. Maybe you're more educated than the elders in a congregation, right? That's possibility in, in this age, especially. A lot of times ministers are very highly educated. So sometimes ministers are maybe more educated than elders, but it doesn't give them authority over the elder. Uh, the elders still, in the end, have to decide. That's still their decision. So to be able to teach is a really big thing. To know the scriptures well enough to teach them is, uh, is a big thing. Does that mean they have to teach? Well, I think it, in some respects um, they do, especially on an individual basis, uh, individual Bible study, stuff like that. I don't think it means they have to stand up in front of a congregation and teach, you know, every week. But, you know, that they have to be able to do it, able to expand on God's word. Right, and so elders had that ability or had that duty. Um, yeah. How to st how to do what now? No. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think there's a test you give an elder to see how much knowledge of Scripture they have, but I think that, you know, when you put a man up for that, I, I hope you know what kind of person that is, and they've been in the congregation long enough that you would know their, what their aptitude is, you know. I mean, I, to be able to, to determine doctrine, to be able to, um, you know, look at Scripture, that's, that's a big thing for an elder. I mean, I think that's, you know, elders are spiritual leaders. We forget that. We'll get into that. But elders are spiritual leaders. I mean, when I know in our world, they're physical leaders too. But you got to remember, in the first century, elders didn't have what they didn't have. What we have, they didn't have buildings and vans and all this other stuff going on. Their predominant function was spiritual leader. That was their predominant function. No, they didn't. But, you know, still, their primary obligation is the spiritual leadership of a church. Um, and that's something that you have to be knowledgeable enough uh, to be able to do. So I think that's a big thing. Not addicted, not pugnacious. That's a great word, pugnacious. Not a word we use much anymore. Does anybody know what pugnacious means? Yep, fighter, right? It means a brawler, not a brawler. Um, so that's a, you know, does that mean they might never, ever not get in a fight? You know, that's the thing. You gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta temper this a little bit, you know, we're all a human. We're all going to make mistakes. Elders are going to make mistakes. Ministers are going to make mistakes, you know, um, but I think it's the nature, right? I mean, sometimes something might happen, but is that the nature of the person? You know, is that their nature? Are they a brawler by nature, you know, or not? Well, of course, you wouldn't want that. Um, a lot of people say there was no fermented drink in the Bible. I always look at this passage. I don't know how you could be addicted to grape juice. I think my wife might be addicted to grape juice sometimes, but, you know, 
I don't think that's what we're talking about here. It doesn't say they never have wine. It says not addicted to it, right? So in other words, that they don't have to have it. Um, gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, which is a big thing because they do have control of our finances and what goes on. And that's the reason there's always a plurality of elders, right? There's always people. That's always a check and balance system, right? You never want one person in charge of the, of the purse strings. You don't want to have a Judas, right? Judas was over the treasury and... Judas dipped into the treasury, the scripture says, a little bit, right? So, uh, you know, you don't want to have a love of money, which um, that's one thing. A plurality does that. He has to manage his household well, keeping his children under control. We're almost out of time. So, I've had that argument before. Can he have, does he have to have more than one child? Does he have to have multiple children? Can, what if they're adopted? What if they're not his own children? Does that make him, does that disqualify him, right? Um, we've had that case come up here several years ago. Um, one child adopted. And, you know, we actually had Stafford North come down from Oklahoma Christian, who's now dead, who wrote the book I gave out on Sunday night, the Revelation book. Um, his response was, you know, pretty simple. If you only have one child and somebody, and you fill out a form that says, do you have children? What do you mark? Right? Yes. Right? You wouldn't say, no, I only have one child. You would just say, yes, I have children. So that's what I mean. We can narrow this. We can, we can, we can cut this thing up so bad that absolutely nobody can be qualified to be an elder. I thought he resigned when he moved. What do you think about that, Gary? Yeah, that's the same way. I, I think that's absolutely it. Yeah. Because once again, what's the nature of the man you're looking for? You're looking for someone who takes care of his children, who manages his children well, who that's what you want. Because if he can manage his own household, if he can manage his own children, then that makes him more qualified to manage us as children, right? <laughs> I think he has to have at least one child. I think children, I think a child is a request. Well, I'm like Gary. I think adopted or natural. I don't think that really matters because you're looking for a man who knows how to manage, who just manage his children. We're not covering that tonight because we're two minutes over and we're not going to get to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's absolutely the spiritual management of your household and your children. I absolutely agree with that too, but I... But I still think you're looking for the nature of the man. You know, can he manage his children, spiritually manage, whether it be one child or multiple children or adopted or your own, it still comes back to what kind of man are you looking for? You're looking for a man who can take care of his family, who can manage his children spiritually. Right. So there's reasons these things are put into place. Reasons Paul says this is what you need. So... I think we're going to wait till next week because we got to talk about them staying under subjection, and I think we're going to get off on that. So I think we need to wait and do that next Wednesday night. <laughs> so we'll do that. Yeah, if they're the age to be saved, the age to be Christians, and they're not, then that might that might reflect absolutely. <laughs>